Uh, hello. Um, I'm Florin. I work for Adobe. And I'm going to discuss a bit the future proof content architecture designs. And this is the agenda. So uh, we all know that um, the, the content architecture design has a direct impact on every aspect of a Sling-based or AEM-based application, uh, uh, starting from its inception and uh, up to all the deployments and upgrades that follow. Uh, in the session, I'd like to discuss uh, first uh, analyzing uh, the content structures that we have in AEM. Uh, we know that uh, everything is content, but, but not content is the same. So we will first take a look at what we have now in AM. Uh, then discuss a bit uh, uh, what we call content categories. So basically, uh, we'll want to try to describe the content um, by using a set of uh, feature requirements to the storage deployment and usage patterns of the content models. And <coughs> We'll now, dis dis uh, after this, we'll discuss how uh, using these content categories will help us with the uh, uh, content ma maintenance and management in the future. And in the last part, I'll have a, a quick use case uh, on using uh, Sling context aware configurations and how does this help us with uh, uh, properly structuring our content. So uh, I'm going to start with, with the content structure analysis in AM. EM. And before starting that, uh, well, w why, why do we want to do that? So uh, during, uh, uh, during the time while we're working on different uh, aspects and uh, architectural areas in AM, we, we kind of dis uh, discovered that we, we don't really have like a clear guidelines of what content should go where. So uh, we do have some, some guidelines with regards to separating uh, the concerns of uh, you know uh, whatever is provided outside of the box by us developers, and uh, whatever is overlaid by the customers, you know, with lips or apps, and there's also like a very clear re requirement with uh, where users and uh, groups usually go, like home users, home uh, groups. But uh, other than that, it, it's we don't really have a guideline of where to put new content or new code or so on and so forth, and. Uh, this basically uh, leads to a couple of challenges. So, uh, one one of them is, uh, as you probably know, it's the etc mess. So you don't know where to store something. Okay, just throw it under etc, and you're going to be fine or not, depending. Uh, yes, everything is content, and but we kind of have a little bit of everything scattered everywhere, and uh, this leads usually to clashes uh, between our stuff and the customers. Uh, uh, stuff. And uh, of course, the guidelines would obviously help if someone new comes to the team and has something, a content model to, a new content model to set up. Uh, it should be easy and very clear on where to put that based on a, a couple of requirements. And obviously, uh, with regards to the clashes between our content and the customer's content, we, we actually have two, two separate problems here. One, sees, one of them is uh, if we in Adobe want to change one of our content models, uh, it may be that the, the customers have already changed that behind the scenes, so it will be a problem if you just overwrite it on install. And we also have the vice versa, uh, where Usually, we have in-place edits of the stuff that we are shipping, uh, which leads to the same issue. So what we did, we, we, we realized that we need to understand what, what, we, when we, what we have in AM before being able to do so, this kind of uh, bundling. And uh, we, we needed to do like a content inventory, so everybody had to go through all the content packages and bundles and so on and so forth and see w what do we have there. And, and then uh, all the content models uh, were basically described based on their origin, uh, the storage, uh, and deployment and usage pattern. And we call those uh, content categories. Uh, once we did that, we extract the set of feature requirements, 
and try to uh, combine uh, similar features or similar groups of features to certain storage locations like root folders. Uh, the ones that are kind of uh, addressing the same concerns should probably go into the same location. So this is how uh, the root structure looks like in AM63. And what we wanted to do is ask ourselves, uh, w what exactly are, are we shipping here? W w what we have here? And uh, what, what th does this folder con contain specifically? Uh, do all the content models uh, address the same concerns or not? So uh, basically, to do that, we needed a set of questions uh, to ask about the content models to see if content models address or not the same uh, concerns. We call those uh, content categories. And uh, similar concerns should probably uh, be placed in the same location if we are to make uh, maintenance and man management easier for the future. Uh, in the same location, I, I'm referring to basically uh, the same root container, if possible. Now, we basically had a long discussion and uh, had to decide on a set of questions to ask. Uh, we ended up with six questions or flags or categories. Uh, I know these are not the only questions we, you may ask about the content models, but uh, we kind of realized that if we are to have uh, more than six, it will be very difficult to properly uh, manage this, and if we have uh, too few, uh, there, there will be aspects that we will not consider related to the content models. So these are the first three. Uh, we have the producer category, and the question will be who produces this content. Uh, there is then the consumer category, which is about the actual consumer of the content model. Uh, the configuration category, uh, is this content model a kind of configuration or not? We then have uh, the disposable category. Is this disposable at runtime? Uh, you may think this as a kind of cache or not. So does this hurt uh, if, the if the content is wiped? Uh, can it be re easily regenerated or not? Uh, updatable at runtime category. Do we need uh, updates at runtime? Do you need to be able to write to this content or not? Uh, one example will be page editing. You obviously need to uh, write to a page to be able to do stuff there. And then there's the cluster shared category, which is about uh, do we want this to be shared in a cluster or not? I is it OK for this to be shared in a cluster? Uh, related to my previous example with the page editing, you, if you have a cluster with m multiple AM instances, you probably need the, uh, the, the page to be shared. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Uh, a good example of uh, things that we don't want to share in a cluster uh, are the, is, is the application code. And now, uh, the last four questions are basically yes or no questions. Uh, the first two are more like uh, roles that you may uh, consider for, for, for the, uh, the, the answer. And the, the producer, uh, we found out that we will have these roles, actually. And uh, there's the AM developer, which is basically whatever we're shipping uh, as part of the product. Uh, there's the integrator or the customer, so whatever customizations are, are being done on top of the product once the stuff is shipped. Uh, there's the DevOps, which is mostly, uh, usually mostly configuration. So if uh, you have uh, uh, to deploy and maintain multiple configuration in multiple aspects, you usually have like a configuration management some, somewhere that handle this. And there's, there's the classic user and system. Uh, the, the user is basically usually uh, whatever you, you consider to be external to the AM application. And the, uh, in a general sense, is a, maybe a browser or uh, something call, calling an API. Uh, the system is obviously the AM system, in internal system. For the consumer, we only consider these two roles, which is user and system. The user is usually just, uh, as before, a client or a browser or an API consumer. And the system is the AM system itself. 
uh, a good example for, for the system consumer would be the, the workflows or the job definitions, which are basically consumed within the AM. Now, uh, once we have the, the set of questions, we can, we can see how, how they can be applied to content models and how that will help us uh, down the road to do uh, maintenance and management. So the, the, the content categories should allow us to align the content architecture uh, with the concerns the, the, the content models uh, are addressing. So, and this will uh, allow us to have a clear separation of concerns between the various roles producing content and the ones consuming them. Now, the thing is that once we did that, we needed a place to bundle those together. And uh, we obviously wanted to use uh, something from, from the set we already have. So uh, we had to decide which ones do we, we use. So from, from this is, again, uh, a snapshot of uh, the root structure in 6.3. And we decided to, uh, on one hand, not introduce any new top folder, because that's already too confusing. And we decided to stick with this set. And uh, what you are probably noticed already, there's no ETC in here. And th the split is basically, we have libs, which is strictly restricted to AM uh, developers provided content. So it's whatever we ship outside of the box. Uh, this should be instance private, if by any chance you're uh, thinking about setting up a cluster. And our rec recommendation is uh, it should be read-only at runtime. So you, n you never perform writes at runtime, o only deploy time updates. Then there's apps, which uh, is, should have the same restrictions as libs, but uh, designed only for customer uh, or integrator provided uh, overlays. Just as before, it should not be uh, writable at runtime by any chance if you want to set it up in a cluster. And it, uh, yeah, and that's it. We have conf which uh, if you remember the presentation on the uh, context aware configuration, it is the uh, global configuration uh, container. Well, not global, also tenant, but uh, yeah. Uh, the idea is that the conf is the uh, location of the runtime uh, deployed uh, configurations, so the, the ones that you can configure at runtime. Uh, otherwise, those should go to libs or apps. Then there's content, everybody knows that. It's the user space user-generated content. And then there's var and temp, which uh, there's only a small difference between them. Uh, we found out that they're mostly system content, uh, not only system content, there's only some user content, but mostly system. The difference is that uh, temp is disposable while var I is not. So based on the content categories and the, the content buckets that we just uh, uh, considered earlier, we built like a very large uh, table with all the f category values and where they should put content. And this is just a short example. Uh, there's a full mapping in the appendix if you are to download the, the presentation. So as a short example, uh, if the producer is the M developer, and the consumer should be the user for non-configurations, non-disposable uh, cluster visible content, that should go to slash content. And if the producer is the ML developer consumed by the user for non-disposable, not non-cluster visible and non-writable content, that should be libs. And yeah, you have the full uh, mapping at the end of the presentation. So the thing is that uh, structuring uh, the content like this will, will allow us to uh, do better maintenance and management in the future. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, allows us a very good separation of concerns. So we, we have uh, outside of the box uh, goes to libs. We have integrator stuff goes to uh, 
uh, apps, and also we have uh, runtime models to the rest of the repository, either if it's, if it's configurations, they go to conf or content or so on and so forth. This allows us uh, to do overlays instead of in-place edits, so we'll not have the, the clash that I was discussing earlier. Uh, Obviously, this uh, avoids overlapping filters because we as Adobe only ship to libs and uh, uh, customer content only goes to apps. And there's also no generic storage locations, so we don't have like an ETC bucket somewhere where you can just throw stuff around and not be sure about what's it about. And that, that being said, and now I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna have a use case, so I'm gonna leverage the context aware configs. Uh, and try to show you how you can structure the configuration so you don't uh, end up with clashing uh, concerns. So let's assume that you have uh, that we have a configuration that's in, in etc. So it's the etc media player config uh, that has one uh, property which is speed, and you just ship that. And at some point. Uh, at in the subsequent version, we may want to add another property, like uh, the quality, uh, assuming this is uh, controlling some kind of uh, video playback or whatever. So th the thing is, uh, once you want to have another property and deploy that and ship it, you have a problem. Uh, that's, that may already be changed. So. Uh, First of all, the speed might be already changed uh, by the either customer or integration integrator or the DevOps, or there may already be changes at runtime by the users. Uh, simply installing this or overwriting this on update uh, isn't safely possible. And 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 the answer would be uh, using Sling context aware configs. And what we can do is uh, <coughs> you leverage Sling context array configurations, which will allow us to properly separate the concerns of what we're shipping. So we have an outside of the box configuration in libs. We have the integrator or customer one in apps. And if by any chance we require any runtime uh, edits or runtime provided stuff, uh, that should go to either conf uh, global or conf tenant if you need tenant level configuration for that. So uh, in this case, if by any chance uh, we at Adobe will want to provide an updated uh, model for the outside of the box config, we can do that without wiping the customer provided one or the runtime edits for that matter. And depending on how uh, inheritance in is configured in, in at the Sling context aware configuration, uh, this will allow us to either uh, get already the, the integrator provided config. So uh, even though we ship uh, our uh, a new updated configuration, uh, the system still, still sees the, the, the custom one from the customer. And this is a short example of how you can uh, uh, read the properties. So you just use a configuration resolver, and based on that, uh, you fetch a config builder uh, using the co current resource as a context. And based on its name, you will be able to get the properties as a value map. Uh, this will e either return the, the properties uh, in, in apps or conf or libs, depending on which on one is the system, if inheritance is configured, you will actually get a merge between uh, your custom configuration and uh, the outside of the box one. So the Sling context array uh, configuration feature has a very complex uh, resolution algorithm, which uh, allows a very good separation of concerns for, for the different producers we discussed earlier. And this is the uh, lookup order. So you have libs for, for the uh, outside of the box configs, uh, apps for uh, overlaid configs, and then there's conf global. Uh, these three work as uh, fallbacks, global fallbacks. And then there's conf tenant and conf tenant, 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 and so on and so forth if you need uh, tenant level customizations. 
I, I'm not going to go into details. You already uh, uh, know the presentation earlier. Uh, the main features would be that uh, you can configure property inheritance, child configuration list, list mer merging, and uh, custom configuration lookup. Uh, you can take a look at Sling Apache Org for, for the full features and documentation. And now, as closing words, uh, I'm going to show you a short summary of uh, the various uh, content producer roles and uh, the, the repository locations that uh, they should own and manage. So again, we have libs, which should be owned only by AM developers. And um, you should only provide stuff there at deploy time, not runtime. No runtime customizations. There's apps, which is owned by integrator or DevOps, which should also be provided at deploy time. There's conf, the runtime uh, configuration space for uh, DevOps users and system, which can be uh, customized at runtime if required. We have content, which is basically uh, uh, can be modified by all. And then there's vars, var and temp, which are mostly user space, but also user can, uh, uh, mostly system space, but also the users may provide content there. And uh, it's only for runtime content. Uh, as the reference, you have the Sling context array configs. Uh, there's a full documentation at Sling. And that being said, thanks a lot for hearing me out. Thank you. So, any questions? There's one here in the front on the right hand side. Hello, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Thank you for your talk, uh, first of all. Um, um, maybe I'm missing something, but. I know, and it looks all nice, but um, what's now the purpose? So what are you doing with, the, with this like classification? So you have this nice table, and you have all the content. And yeah, it might be kind of a guideline if you have your content to put it in the right places. But what do we do now with it? Well, okay, okay so <coughs> for the new content model, obviously, you can use this to uh, find out where you can where you can put a specific content model based on those flags. But uh, what we are doing it for is basically we went to all the content that we have and kind of said, OK, maybe this should not go there and should be moved. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give, give, give a bit of context um, to that. Like it's, this is uh, basically an exercise that is done, was done internally to, to um, see how we can bas basically um, get a cleaner decision for where we will put f um, content in the future uh, when we deploy stuff. Um, yeah, we wanted to have a clear separation of, the, of the, all the concerns. And yeah, basically, we had a lot of mixed concerns. In the, we have a lot of uh, folders and stuff thrown around. And the thing is that uh, there's the ETC mess. We wanted to kind of see how we can solve that for, I don't know, how, how long. So we had this exercise that basically separates whatever we provide versus whatever the integrator provides and whatever can be customized by the user at runtime. And this obviously uh, allows us uh, for better maintenance ourselves and also for the future when we want to deploy. You already uh, noticed the, the talk by Dominic and uh, uh, Robert earlier that if you want to uh, do like a better upgrade here, if you have mixing concerns, th there is very hard to do that. You, you can't do that because you have to rewrite all the models at runtime. So it, it, yeah. yeah, and if you want to have the call to action for you is basically when you start to design, and I, we know that we have some buckets, we have some stuff that we ha in the past have shifted to ETC, and we have seen that a lot of partners or customers have the need to put some content somewhere. So we have had made this exercise for everything that we do, and I, we think that um, partners should have this knowledge as well and start to really think about where to put the content correctly. So. 
if you want to make use of all the features that we were discussing before, something like the, the, uh, the mechanism with Docker, when we eventually get there, your code will also need to be adapted that same way. Yeah, well, I think there was a question yesterday uh, about the code that's in ETC. Well, if you want to use Docker and up upgrade the application faster, you won't be able to do that if, you, if your code is somewhere in that's basically shared across the cluster. So you need, to have, you need to isolate that in something that's local and it's pluggable. So yeah, that will probably not end up in ETC with this category table. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, sorry. Um, if, if we've got some code in ETC at the moment, and presumably that's going to move across to apps, is, is there a danger that um, if those static assets are then served out through the you know, through publicly, um, that the users might kind of open up apps a bit too much unless there's a a specific path for public kind of code. Well, de depends on the code. What kind of codes uh, do you I'm, have? I'm in thinking it? JavaScript, CSS, uh, static assets, part of the application deployment, but that are kind of delivered directly to the client. Well, it depends. I mean, if it's static, if you have images, I, I don't know if that's a problem or not. So the answer is that the specifically for client libraries and AEM, Client libraries have had this feature actually for three or four releases uh, called proxying, where it basically creates an endpoint in ETC that maps to a path in apps or libs. And so you actually can see this today in We Retail. There was a problem, but it wasn't documented, but as part of this project that Florian's been working on, we realized it wasn't documented, and it is now. Um, but if you look at the we retail code, it, it uses this extensively for this exact purpose. Yeah, if there are other case, I'm not aware if there are other cases of code in ETC. It's mostly like this weird hodgepodge <laughs> of configs and uh, that some of out of the box and some are, uh, you know, the workflow stuff and what have you. So the, the client libs are, are a pretty special case. But Thank you. Any other questions? So if not, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've, you've got one? Yeah, just, just a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, how strict are you with a configuration, with a, with a configuration bucket when it comes to cons configuration of the content that I keep in content itself. Meaning that I understand that any application and so on should, the configuration for that should lay in conf and then I should have reference to it and so on. But if I configure my website concerning, I don't know, templates or whatever, um, is it still so that I need to map the, the content to the configuration um, um, bucket as Stefan yeah. showed us yesterday. Are you that strict that you have to map that or is it in your eyes allowed in a way to keep some configuration information within the content, it's as within the content tree itself? Well, it depends if you, you need like a, some kind of context separation. Uh, you can, I mean, there's also always the option or, of not mapping it in which case you will default to the global ones. So if you don't map it, if you don't put a mapping uh, in your content page or whatever, uh, and try to resolve a configuration based on that context, it obviously won't find any link and it will default to conf global uh, apps or libs in this order. Okay. Okay, then thank you Florine for your Thanks. talk.